Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, I have the pleasure to present today. And uh, part of my practice, I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and uh, I subspecialize in spine surgery for adults and children, I mean children and adolescents, not adults, and uh, fractures in children, uh, birth defects, deformities. Uh, there's a lot of adolescent and pediatric sports medicine involved in our practice and here at MOSH. So uh, I thought it'd be good to go over spine problems in children today, because that's uh, very important, obviously. Disclosure. Okay, starting with the, the basics, uh, for low back pain, really important to stick with the basics initially. Uh, get, a, get a complete history. So usually when I see a kid, uh, they've already uh, oftentimes been with primary care or PT, chiropractor, trainer, and uh, they're not getting better, or they've had a serious acute injury and are in severe pain, so they want to be seen right away. Uh, but some, some just come in with a nagging injury on their own, too. So uh, in the history, I, you know, I want to ask them, I want to be sure I understand the history. They say 90% of diagnosis is made in the history. I know that's true in orthopedics. So, uh, you know, their age, sex, uh, mechanism of injury. Was there a sudden injury? Did it come on gradually? How long has it been there? Uh, what was that mechanism of injury? Uh, what kind of pain is it? Where is it located? You know, sometimes kids will, will say they have low back pain, but they're, they'll point to their buttock or upper pelvis, and maybe they've injured something around the hip area. So, you know, you really have to, if we're talking about low back pain or back pain, you, you really need to delineate the location. And they can point that out, you know, on their own body to make sure, you know, you, you understand w what they're talking about. Um, is there any uh, radiating pain? What's the nature of the pain? Does the pain radiate into the buttock? Uh, is it more on one side or the other? Uh, does it go down the leg? Uh, pain that goes below the knee, you know, from the back into the buttock, down the back of the thigh, below the knee into the front of the leg, side of the leg, foot, bottom of the foot. Those are uh, nerve root symptoms called radicular pain. So, uh, you know, you, you really want to get a very good history. And then in the history, you want to know in the girls' uh, menstrual history, because um, girls will be growing for about a year and a half after their first period. And the boys, obviously, we can't do that, but uh, Dr. Kasempa talked about Tanner stage development, and that, that's helpful. And he talked about bone age x-ray of the hand, and that's, that's more in the workup, but that, that's very helpful, too. How much growth is remaining? Um, family history. Is there a family history of scoliosis or uh, back pain injury problems? Like, uh, you know, we, we know what spondylolysis is. It's a crack in the lower back, uh, usually at L5, less common at L4, other levels. Well, there are families that have, have that in their lineage, even, and there's certainly scoliosis and other issues. Um, and, and of course, uh, the patient's past medical history. Do they have any metabolic problems? Uh, any other illnesses? Um, other, and other questions to ask, you know, bowel or bladder dysfunction, you know? Like a serious uh, back problem uh, with bowel or bladder dysfunction, that, that's a sign of a possible emergency going on with a lot of uh, nerves severely compressed. Um, Fever, have they been ill lately? Do they have a prodromal illness? Could it be an infection? Have they been worn out lately? Could they have some sort of a tumor or leukemia? You know, you know, really, the history is really important to sort of guide you along. And then, uh, of course, you know, what meds are they on? Uh, some medications may reduce bone density. Uh, and Dr. Gulsdorf talked about vitamin D, you know, have they not had enough vitamin D calcium in their diet? Do they not drink much milk? Are they drinking juice and 
water and sports drinks and soda. I hear that a lot. No, my, my kid doesn't like milk, you know? So that's a factor. Um, social history. Most kids aren't smokers, but it's good to get a social history, of course. Um, review of systems. Are there any other illnesses ongoing? So it's important to take a complete history. Then on exam, okay, we're really focusing on low back pain today, or back pain, I guess, in general as well. So the location. And certain things on exam sort of get me thinking uh, disc uh, versus muscle strain versus uh, bony pain. So uh, palpate, uh, look at their back first, of course. Do they have any abnormal curves, pigmentations, hairy patches, dimples along their back, signs of some sort of a spinal deformity? Uh, look at their flexibility. Look at their stature, their posture. Do they have, you know, miserable posture, or they stand up ramrod straight, or somewhere in between. Uh, leg lengths, you know, we see patients that are sent for scoliosis, and, and one leg is maybe an inch longer than the other, or a half inch, or whatever, and it, you know, so look at your leg lengths. Palpation, okay, are they, so, are they tender along some muscles, the paraspinal muscles? Are they point tender at L5 or L4? Uh, motion, how's their motion? If they have more pain on forward flexion and limited forward flexion due to pain, I think more of a disc injury as a possible diagnosis. If they have more pain on extension, limited extension due to pain, I'm thinking more about the posterior elements like the pars, the posterior facets, spinous processes. Um, Motor exam, is there weakness? Sensory exam, is that intact? Reflexes, okay? So a good exam. And then, you know, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I want to know what the bones look like. So the best way I can look at the bones, obviously, in my office is an x-ray. Okay, so for lower back, if you're going to get lumbar films, uh, AP, lateral, and obliques for back pain. You may, you may see something on the AP, usually not. Maybe you'll see a little scoliosis. Uh, maybe you'll see an anomaly. Uh, maybe a, a lesion, but usually they're normal. Lateral view, maybe you'll see a spondylolisthesis, a forward slippage of one vertebra over the vertebra just below it. Uh, maybe you'll see a defect, a lesion, a fracture. Usually not. Usually it's a normal x-ray. Uh, the obliques are really excellent for looking at the, uh, the facet joints and the little part of the bone between the facet joints called the pars intraarticularis, which is the part between the joints. In other words, articular pars intraarticularis. Great name. Uh, and it looks like a Scotty dog, and I'll show you some of those and how to read that. Okay, most of these kids are going to have normal x-rays, or maybe you'll see a little something, a little defect. Okay, so uh, scans are helpful. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, you, you, you won't have any diagnosis at this point. You may have an idea, but all the x-rays are normal. Uh, but let's say it's not normal. Maybe you see a, a crack in L5 on the oblique x-ray. Scans are really helpful. How, how far apart is that crack? Could it, you know, is it recent? Maybe it could heal in a brace with, with good nutrition. Is it old? Uh, so a scan, an MRI is good to, to look for edema, that's a more recent injury in the bone. MRI is good for looking at the discs and the nerves. CT scan is particularly good for looking at bone. If you're evaluating a, a crack in the bone, is it separated or is it close together? Is it a pre-crack? Is it all the way through? Is it part way through? So uh, CT scan in general is better for looking at the bony lesions. Now, if you order a CT scan of the lumbosacral spine, they may take like 50 or 60 slices. Okay, you don't need all that. If they were tender at L5 or L4, you can limit the CT scan to uh, L4 through S1. And you want to be sure that they send you the, uh, the axials. Those are the cuts like this way through the body. And the sagittals. Coronals are nice, but they're not as important. Sagittals go this way, like the sagittal crease in your skull. Let's see if you remember sagittal. Um, bone scan can show uh, whether a lesion is acute or not. 
And we're getting less and less bone scans now uh, because the MRI will show uh, acuteness with edema in the bone. But uh, certainly bone scan is still an excellent test. Uh, if a bone scan is hot at an area of a crack in the bone, then it it's still uh, has a good chance for healing in a brace as long as the bone is close together. Uh, if the bone scan is, is normal there or cold, then this has probably been going on for a while and less likely to heal in a brace. Doesn't mean you won't try a brace, but it's less likely to be good for bone healing per se. Labs, okay. Usually I don't get labs for back pain. There's usually a history of an injury or it's been there uh, for a while and when they're active it gets worse. Oh, and back to the history, uh, the discs uh, and the spondylos, they tend to have pain when they're standing and more active. Uh, uh, the di disc pressure increases with uh, sitting the most or if they're carrying an object in front of them, a heavy object especially, and standing. So I'll, I'll the disc patients uh, are more comfortable laying down. Some of the patients with a stress fracture even have pain laying down. But labs, you know, have they had a prodromal illness? Have they, are they sickly? Are they worried about something unusual? So they get a CBC with differential, SED rate, C-reactive protein to check for infection, a metabolic workup potentially to check uh, for any sort of a liver enzyme elevation. Etc. So, uh, but usually I don't get labs in this at this stage. Okay. So, some of the basic differential diagnosis for these injuries. The most common thing is there's nothing serious going on. Okay. Even if they've been uh, in some treatment. And back to the uh, history. Have they had treatment? Have they been going to PT or chiropractor? Uh, Personally, I don't recommend chiropractors except as like a last ditch. Uh, if there's nothing really basically very wrong with the kid. But, uh, but you know, PT has a huge role. Um, have they tried the PT, rest, bracing, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories? But uh, by the time, you know, we're of a lot of concern and we've gotten uh, x-rays uh, and we're deciding whether or not to get scans if we have a if it's a pretty recent they're not all that bad you know maybe you're gonna hold off on the scan and, and just try some PT uh, you know get them in some or they have poor posture and you think it has to do with weak core poor posture get them in some PT get them in some training see them back in a, in a month or you know tell them hey, if you get all better you don't even have to come back but if it keeps getting bad you know come back or call us and we'll order an MR and have you come in with an MR to review or a CT and you bring that in. So, uh, but a after uh, we pretty much eliminated muscle, tendon, ligamentous strain, then we're thinking about is it the disc injury or is there a defect in the bone, a PARS defect as I talked about. And I'll show you an x-ray of what that looks like. Uh, Fractures, I mean, usually you'll see that on a plane film, a compression fracture or an obvious PARS fracture, and you probably already, you know, have made that diagnosis. Unusual conditions like tumor, infection. Discitis is an infection in uh, the disc space. It's thought to emanate from the vertebral body into the disc space. Uh, it's very rare. I can remember a kid at Children's Hospital who had their appendix removed and then they finally figured out the, the pain was uh, from a discitis. That's a strange one. It can really uh, befuddle people. But it's rare, but you know, you have to think about unusual conditions too. Okay, so if I'm suspecting a disc injury and it's pretty mild, you know, I might not even get the MRI right off the bat. I just tell them to rest. I feel that you know they might make it worse if, if there's a little rupture in the outer lining of the disc, the outer layer called the annulus, and that's bulging. Uh, that could get bigger if they s do some strenuous activity, and it could become a lot worse. So I rest them, get them in PT. You got PT trains them in how to handle their back better. You know, bend with the knees, not with your back. Don't lift heavy objects in front of you. You know, restrictions. Keep them out of sports. And I'll, I'll, a suspected disc without an MRI, you know, if they're a great athlete and they want to get back pretty quick, 
Well, I, I won't really know how to quickly how quickly to send them back without an MRI, probably. So in this day and age, with an athlete, you know, I'll tend to go ahead and get a scan, an MRI for a suspected disc or uh, acute uh, a, a recent PARS injury, and perhaps a CT, or just go first with the CT. Okay, so this is an example of a 16-year-old girl who. Uh, is an elite athlete, she's in many sports, she's just an all-round great athlete. And she came in with a uh, right-sided, uh, let's see, maybe she was left, because yeah, it's left. The, there's a narrowing here. This is where the nerve root comes out. This is the vertebral body, those are her kidneys on either side, paraspinal muscles. These are facet joints in the back. There's the lamina, the uh, Try not to have my hands shake because I am a surgeon and I don't, you know, want you to think I have shaky hands. <laughs> but as you can see, the laser magnifies the shakes. But uh, the spinous process here. So in a normal disc, look at a normal level. Okay, this is T2. Water is white in an MRI on T2. So the spinal fluid is white. And you can see some dark gray lines in there in the spinal uh, fluid sac, in the dural sac. Those are nerve roots. The spinal cord ends at L1, okay? So we're worried about nerve roots in the lower back. And then the normal disc has a high water content. And I know Nicole was talking about hydration. This is a well hydrated normal disc. So is this one, this one? So you look at L34, L45, and L5S1, they're already degenerated. This girl has been so active with her sports and multiple injuries. She's in and out of my office all the time for injuries. She's an incredible girl. I guess she's a little injury prone. But you can see at L4, it's really way, pushing way back, way back, and L, L3, 4, a little less, pushing back a little bit. Normally, disc bulge a little, okay? But th this is uh, extra bulgy at these two and, and way bulged out here. And this, this dark blob just behind the disc, that's ruptured disc material here and then some in here so it's squeezing the nerve root that's why she has pain down her left leg okay so uh you know what, how, what do we do with her okay so uh the non-surgical treatments usually work for mild to moderate discs i'd say that one's a moderate the radiologist called it mild you know uh but she was very symptomatic. So, you know, I was encouraging. I said, you know, very unlikely to need surgery. Uh, the disc area can heal uh, with some scarring over time. It can pull back in. But in the acute phase, you know, you don't see it because it's deep in there, but there's swelling. You know, like if you tear an ankle ligament, well, this is like tearing, you know, that kind of tissue deep in your spine. You know, there's all that swelling and there's some blood and you know, there's only so much room for the nerve roots. So she was very symptomatic. So uh, I didn't put here non steroidal anti inflammatories, but certainly, you know, those are great, okay? Um, but th there's a limit because it can affect the kidneys. So, you know, but keep the dose within what's appropriate for, for their weight and age group. Um, the nerve is trapped in this girl because of the swelling and the disc protrusion. So she has that pain down her leg, radiculopathy. So the physical therapy, we want to get the, 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 the nerve sliding and gliding normally again. So get that flexibility going, uh, strengthen the core, uh, work on good posture, teach her how to protect her disc in PT. And uh, that's a big disc injury, so you know she, she's going to be out of sports for a while. Because even after, I expect her symptoms will resolve, but uh, it's got to heal. We don't want more discs to come out. So you know if she did well with therapy, uh, you know she's still probably going to be out for oh three months. Uh, brace, okay. Sometimes I'll put them in a brace just for pain relief. Okay, not a hard plastic brace, but you know, a decent brace, and, and maybe they'll use that for some of their sports at first, or some of their workouts. Uh, but you know, we don't want them to be reliant on the brace and have muscle atrophy, so, so we'll limit that some. Um, 
course, you know, rest, activity restrictions. Now, this particular patient, she did not improve an iota with therapy and some bracing. So I sent her uh, for epidural steroids. And, you know, we have Dr. Edwards here who's an expert at that procedure. And uh, he probably did this patient for all I know. I sent him a lot of work. And uh, that usually works. So how does that work? People, patients will say, well, that's a Band-Aid. I don't want that, you know, or nobody's sticking a needle in my kid's back. Well, it's, if the child's not getting better and you don't want to go to surgery, it's a great intermediate step. The way it works is the cortisone has a very powerful anti-inflammatory effect, and it'll decrease all that edema and swelling that's adding to the pressure and compression on the nerve. Okay, so, so then the PT maybe can work, you know, get things moving and sliding and gliding and feeling better. Uh, usually you'll have to repeat it uh, in uh, 10 days or 14 days, at least once. Sometimes they'll get three shots, okay? And then you still have got to go through the therapy and the, uh, you know, waiting for it to heal. So, you know, she still has at least three months uh, from presentation before I think she'd be ready if she, if she gets you know enough resolution of her symptoms maybe it'll take longer what about narcotics okay a lot of people think that if we give them a Vicodin that's gonna help okay that's absolutely the worst treatment okay that's not treatment okay that that's just a recipe for disaster because you're gonna mess up their natural endorphins opiate system pretty quickly uh, if it does make them feel better, they're going to be doing stuff that they shouldn't do too active and, and, and stir things up. And, and then when that narcotic uh, wears off, uh, they're going to feel lousy or even worse. And eventually they could build up tolerance. How about uh, a lot of people ask for muscle relaxers, okay? Well, you know, my doctor gave me a mu muscle relaxer. I think my kid needs a muscle relaxer, okay? Muscle relaxers are basically brain relaxers. There's no evidence that they actually relax the muscle. Okay, sure, yeah, they make you feel better. You're like, oh, you know, I feel better. But that stuff's potentially very harmful as well. It's gonna hide the issue. It's not therapeutic. They're like, oh, but she can't move. Well, they walked into my office, you know. She can't get to the bathroom. Well, she walked into my office, he, she. I mean, there's no way they're gonna be prescribed Valium or Robaxin or Flexerol or Percocet or Tylenol with codeine or Oxy. There's no way, except, like, okay, if they have a spine fracture that's acute, but they're probably going to have to be admitted, you know? And it's just going to be short term, okay? But for, for a fairly long standing, you know, back issue, which most of these are, there's, there's no place for narcotics and muscle relaxers. All right, so anyway, this girl, she had her epidural steroids, and it didn't help. So what's the next step? Okay, in the current era, if you're in the, you know, a, a, a center with specialists, uh, like here at MOSH, we have our spine surgeons can do micro discectomy, okay? So basically, uh, the incision at the end of the case, you can cover it with sort of a moderate size Band-Aid. And most people, it's going to be done outpatient these days. So uh, in a standard laminectomy, uh, to, to take out a disc, uh, the open surgery, you're going to remove all of this lamina or part of it. You want to try to leave uh, at least two-thirds of each facet, or you'll destabilize the spine and need a fusion with it. Okay? But we're not doing a laminectomy with a micro disc. We're not taking out any bone. They just remove a little bit of the flavum that's between the bones to make a window, and they're using a scope. So they're just using micro instruments, and they can move the, uh, the dura and the nerve root away from the disc bulge or the rupture, the, the disc that's protruded or extruded, and then they pull it out with a, a, an instrument called a pituitary ranger, which is just a nice thin instrument. You pull out the pieces that have been compressing the nerve, and, and uh, usually you'll, you'll find some loose disc inside the disc space. So the surgeon will also go and pull out any loose disc 
inside there, put the pituitary right inside there and, and pull out all the, as much loose disc as they can. Um, and then, you know, it's got to heal. So, you know, they'll need to be, you know, kept comfortable. Some of them will take uh, narcotics for a few days, but it's, it's not, you know, like the old laminectomy with severe pain. And, and she did great. You know, these, this is a very gratifying surgery for the family and the surgeon because when you take the pressure off the nerve, when they wake up, they feel great. That pain down the leg and the back pain is gone. They'll have a different kind of back pain from the surgery, but that's way better than what they were having before. Now, in kids and adolescent athletes, sometimes uh, a disc cannot be treated with a microdiscectomy. So I found this is an interesting case uh, of a uh, teenager who had presented after an acute injury in gymnastics and uh, had uh, severe back pain and pain down uh, one of the legs, severe pain. And that's called a hard disc. What a hard disc is, this is actually part of the disc and it, the reason it's so big and, and firm and well defined, unlike that mushy looking stuff in the last patient, is this has some of the growth plate on it. So it's holding that hard, firm shape. So it came off from here. And it moved, flipped up way up here, and it's, it's really badly compressing into the dura. Uh, it didn't rupture or tear the dura, but it's compressing it and compressing multiple nerves. OK, this you cannot get out with a microscope, OK? And this is a pretty emergent or, at least, or urgent condition, the patient was very uncomfortable. Um, Cauda equina syndrome is a condition where uh, multiple or all the nerve roots uh, in the lower back, in the lumbar and sacral area, are compressed to a degree that they have uh, numbness in their buttocks. That's called saddle paresthesia or numbness. Uh, leg weakness, bowel and bladder function is, is lost. And that's a surgical emergency, and, and that disc needs to, the nerves need to be decompressed as fast as possible, within 24 hours, ideally. And uh, there's variable recovery, but the sooner you decompress that patient, the better. This patient did not have cotaquina syndrome, but could have gone on to cotaquina because it's such a big injury. So, yeah, you'll need to do a, a standard laminectomy to get that out. And if you did have to, take too much of the facet joints in the back, you'd actually need to do a fusion with it. But uh, the surgeon was able to get it out with a laminectomy without taking facet joint, and there was no fusion needed, and this patient did very well. And this is a case from here. One of our surgeons took care of this patient. Okay, so disc injuries, even though they're tough, the kids, the athletes can return to sports. Okay, we just have to be cautious that they're well healed and, and well rehabbed. But the light at the end of the tunnel is that they will get better, they can return to sports. And most disc injuries, the vast majority, do not require surgical treatment or even epidurals in this age group. I just showed you some examples that did because it you know, shows you the full gamut of treatment. Back pain from tumor. I thought I'd throw in one of those weird diagnoses. I'll point to this side for this side of the room. Okay, so this is a girl who had back pain. And on palpation, I could feel the lump at about L12 in the posterior midline. And uh, there was an erosion here of the bone and widening of the space between the spinous process of L1 and L2, and uh, otherwise the x-rays, unremarkable. Her other, the rest of her exams, unremarkable. No history of trauma. Got the MRI, and this is with uh, gadolinium in the vein, so it enhances. This is a tumor, and uh, the, the MRI tech put these little vitamin E beads on the skin at the area of pain. Uh, just, you know, they like to do that to sort of say, hey, look there. And there it is. Yeah. Um, 
Now, if you have a weak stomach and don't like blood and guts pictures, you should close your eyes. Okay, so this is in the operating room here at MOSH. And uh, this is the tumor bulging out. Just above it on the left is the spinous process of L1. And this gray thing here, this is the spinous process of L2. And uh, the tumor is dissected out very neatly and cleanly. Um, there it is. Uh, went too fast. Sorry. This thing has got a mind of its own sometimes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there it is. We're measuring it inside, taking pictures because it's so unusual. And uh, that's what it looked like. So it was about three by two by two centimeters. And uh, I cut it open on the back table just to look in there. And it was a solid yellow gray tumor, avascular. Now, I figured it was benign because it was well encapsulated, it hadn't caused bony destruction, it did, was probably very slow growing because the bone had just slowly deformed, not truly eroded, but just slowly deformed around it. She'd probably been there for many years, it just got so big she finally felt it and had pain. And again, you know, I could feel it on exam. You could even see a little bulge on her back standing there. Uh, it ended up being a benign what they call the fibroma, which is just a, a blob of fibrous tissue, fairly acellular, excellent prognosis. Now, she had a very quick recovery. I tried to tell her to wear a brace. She, she said she didn't need it. I uh, sent her to some therapy. She said she was feeling fine, and this, this patient was able to return to her sport about six or eight weeks after surgery. Well, sooner than I was comfortable with, but she felt great, so that's fine. You know, so that's just some of the unusual things you might see. Keep an open mind. Okay, the next big category that's pretty common is the spondylolysis. So that's uh, a crack, uh, usually a stress fracture, most commonly at L5, and we see that in uh, uh, athletes who have a repetitive uh, motion of extension and, and a lot of are pushing uh, forward with extension, like football linemen, gymnasts, ice skaters, tennis players. Um, I've seen it in hockey players. You know, other other athletes. Just if they're just a regular, you know, basketball, track, whatever, and they're in a growth spurt. Okay, they're like Dr. Gilsdorf said. You know stress fractures, they, they didn't get a whole lot of vitamin D3 uh, uh, over the winter perhaps, uh, I see a lot of these. And uh, so they're in a growth spurt and they, they're using their, their spine, their bones in general, extra, extra dextra, and so that's a lot of stress and, and the bone has to constantly repair itself. And when it uh, doesn't repair, with the repair process that's naturally ongoing can't keep up They'll develop initially like a microfracture. You know, we don't know, is that symptomatic or not? You know, we don't know, but at some point, they're gonna come in and, and have pain. Now, or it could be an acute spondylolysis. I, I, I show you a case to, in a minute of a boy who uh, had a, a big injury in a football game, uh, varsity football, you know, where he landed on his backside real hard and uh, had severe pain immediately, and that was an acute injury. But most of these are, from stress fracture, from overuse, and uh, most of them respond well to non-surgical treatment. In fact, overall, people with spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis, uh, only about 10% of them will end up having a spine surgery in their lifetime for that, that problem. Um, the difference between spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis is the spondylolysis is the site of the stress fracture. Typically, it's uh, that, uh, I'll show you an x-ray where it's located, but it's in the pars intraarticularis. It's just between the facet joints on the back of the spine, posteriorly. And it could be unilateral or bilateral. Um, and it could be uh, from different causes, uh, you know, stress, trauma, tumor, congenital, developmental. So, you know, there's various causes and, and the treatment sort of breaks down into some different ideas on how to treat it based on the cause and how it looks, you know, when you look at the x-ray and CT, et cetera. But uh, in general, uh, they'll heal 
Ideally, you want them to heal by bone, that the bone grows back together. But uh, the ones that don't heal by bone, they'll, they'll, the majority uh, will, will do fine anyway. They'll heal with some sort of a firm scar tissue because uh, the majority do fine. And what, what we do is we brace them for three months in a rigid clamshell thoracolumbosacral orthosis that limits motion. And uh, they can flex their hips to 90 degrees, so they can sit comfortably, uh, but it, it limits uh, lumbar flexion, extension, lateral bending. And uh, the uh, activity restrictions are nothing with impact, no running, jumping, uh, uh, weightlifting. I'll permit uh, flat military press up to 45 degree angle. I mean flat bench rather, bench, and up to 45 degrees for bench and semi-military and curls, but uh, anything sitting up higher than 45, I, I recommend against that. Nutrition, we, we supplement vitamin D and calcium. So we'll tell them to get Caltrate D or Viactive and take it once a day or some, we'll say twice a day. and. Uh, we don't want the therapist working on nerves gliding and all that motion because it's a fracture, so we want to immobilize it. So uh, we, we'll hold off on the therapy. Or, you know, they could do some isometrics, uh, so maybe one visit to learn those. But uh, the therapy is, is after the bracing. So after three to four months, uh, we'll wean them out of the brace gradually, about one hour less bracing every other day. We go to therapy twice a week for a month, and at the end of that period, we'll try them back at their sports. See how they do. Hopefully they'll do well. So uh, in this case, this is a 16-year-old boy, and it's, there's a little teeny black line in the neck of the Scotty dog. So the Scotty dog, here's his, his upper ear, his eye is huge. Here's his nose, his neck, and I'll go down to this one. Here's his front paw, his body. So the front paw is the part of the facet joint of L5 going downwards to meet the upgoing uh, facet part of S1 going upwards. So that's a facet joint at L5 S1. The ear going up is the, up off the sacrum, or here this ear going up is up off the uh, L5. Okay, here's the uh, L4-5 facet, and this is the L5-S1 facet. So the part in between the joints, the facet joints, the pars intraarticularis, that's where they typically occur. Um, the uh, sclerosis is seen here, a little line. I don't know how well you can see it from the audience, I, I could see it from up here, the little black line there. So most of the time, all these x-rays are negative. You don't see anything, so you'll end up, you know, seeing it maybe on a CT. If, if they have it, of course, you'll see it. Here's a lateral view. There's no slippage. This is not a spondylolisthesis. I don't see any abnormality on the opposite uh, pars, okay? I don't even see sclerosis, really. It looks okay. So I thought, okay, for sure he's got a spondylolysis, and it'd be going on for months and months. It came on gradually. He'd been through uh, a few doctors and some therapy without improvement. Uh, they hadn't gotten an oblique x-ray yet, so he had you know, normal x-rays, they said, but all he had was AP lateral. So that's where you, you need the oblique x-ray. The CT scan shows these really well. That's why we like CT over MRI for spondylolysis. So on the right side, you can see a complete fracture through the pars. This is the pedicle right here. They call that the pedicle. This is the transverse process. This is the pars. This is the lamina, spinous process, vertebral body in the front, the uh, spinal canal. On the left side, you can see there's a fracture line. Doesn't go all the way through like the other side. So he's got a spondylo, an impending spondylolysis on the left, 
and a complete spondylolysis on the right. And these are stress fractures. Okay, sagittal reconstructions. This is the one on the uh, right. See that? So it's the part, the part between the articular joints, pars intraarticularis. You can see the sclerosis. And then on the opposite side, you can see how it doesn't quite go all the way through, but he's, he's working on this side developing. Okay, this is just a, another example. Uh, okay, I said that most of them get better with a brace, rest, calcium, vitamin D, restrictions, rehab, return to sports, non-contact sports in about four or five months, six months. Contact sports, perhaps you want to wait a year, or I'll get a repeat CT before releasing them like back to football, hockey, uh, varsity basketball, you know. But uh, it's always a discussion when to send them back to gymnastics as well for Chelsea. Um, this kid, he had a unilateral. Now the unilaterals are really tough because this is a ring. This bone is a ring. When you have a unilateral, one side cracks and not the other, uh, it's really hard to get it to heal. It's just some, a biomechanical issue. And uh, the um, kid that got that screw on his back, yeah, you know, we tried the bracing, the rest, the therapy, the whole, the whole gamut, the nutrition. And he, he's a linebacker. He's a high school linebacker. Couldn't get him better. So uh, I did an open reduction, internal fixation. This is a vertebral screw. Normally we put the screws in uh, running, like for a fusion, they'll run this way, from the back of the spine towards the front into the body. So this is going right up through the, uh, across the pars, compressing. The back of the screw is big, so it compresses. There's wiring techniques. So just like in that metatarsal non-union, or other non-unions from Dr. Gilsdorf, yeah, the spine surgeon will scrape out the debris and sclerotic bone, get to good bleeding bone, pack in uh, bone graft, we'll use uh, autogenous, you know, the patient's own iliac crest, some really good graft, pack it in there. You don't want to overpack it because then you might compress the underlying nerve root. And then uh, after the surgery, brace them, wait for it to heal, and he healed up and he did return to play in linebacker. He's very fortunate. Okay, so now if there is the slippage, spondylolisthesis is graded. So uh, a zero is basically a spondylolysis, you know. If it's uh, up to 25%, it's a grade one, a slippage forward. Uh, 25 to 50% is a grade two. So most grade ones and twos uh, will do well with a regiment of bracing, rest, nutrition, and physical therapy, and get their uh, pain to resolve. And you know, they may have recurrence of pain, but the surgical indication is unrelenting pain. They can't tolerate that pain. They can't do their lifestyle that they need. Uh, they uh, just are miserable, you know? And uh, maybe they have pain on the leg as well from the instability and the nerves being pulled. So uh, pain and, uh, or any sort of uh, weakness of it from a nerve root uh, would be another indication. Weakness is a problem, but uh, typically there's no weakness. There's pain, sometimes pain down the leg. So uh, this is uh, a kid with a grade, almost a grade two spondylolisthesis. And he had an acute injury now, I think he had probably an underlying spondylolisthesis before the injury that was silent. I've seen a whole bunch of kids that have silent grade one and two. I'm following a girl right now who I've seen since she was eight, now she's 14, and she has a grade two and it's never worsened, it's never progressed, she has no symptoms. We just watch her get an x-ray once a year and we tell her to come back if it becomes painful. But if it never progresses, she'll never need surgery. And she's never had pain either, so. She's doing well, but this fella, the reason I think it's uh, chronic is there's a dome shape to his sacrum. 
So that's a stress change, and, and the L5 is a weird shape. The inferior L5 is a little curved. It's like got a weird shape to it. Uh, the, the pars is elongated. You, you know, you don't see a, 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 a big split there. Um, so I think he had a chronic uh, situation, you know, developmental or even maybe uh, since birth, and, uh, but then it, it got popped when he, when he fell in football. He was 16 years old. So surgical indications are pain unresponsive to all our conservative trials. Uh, typically these are unstable. I'll do flexion extension, lateral x-rays, and I'll see excessive, mo we'll see actual motion at the disc level and motion at the defect of the spondylolysis, the defect in the pars. Uh, pain into the leg, they'll, they'll we'll recommend uh, a decompression uh, along with the uh, fusion. And uh, if they're worsening, progression is another indication. If a grade one and a half goes to a full grade two, they should have surgery. Typically, they have a lot of pain if it's progressing. Okay, uh, surgical treatment is fusion with instrumentation. And I do recommend a gill laminectomy with that. A gill laminectomy, it's a complete removal of the lamina at the broken level, it, usually it's L5, to decompress the nerve roots. Because if you lay a big bunch of bone graft down there and fuse it and instrument it and make it all solid, well, as they age, if they develop narrowing spinal stenosis, you're gonna have to go through a fusion mass, uh, hardware, whatnot, to, to decompress it so sort of a prophylactic, you know, decompression is what I'd recommend in these uh, teenagers uh, when we do the instrumentation and fusion, and certainly if they do have uh, compression. So I'll do a pre-op MRI scan to check, see how tight the nerve root spaces are. They are usually really tight on the ones that go to surgery. This is that same boy, that football player. So you can see the dome shape still that funny shape of the L5-S1 joint. So it's a single level fusion. These are the pedicle screws. See, they're going in the pedicle into the vertebral body at S1 bilaterally and at L5 bilaterally. You see all this white out here is bone graft. We're fusing the, lamb, the uh, transverse process of L5 to the sacrum, top of, outer edge of the sacrum called the sacral ala. Because see, you need the, the transverse process is coming off the vertebral body. It's part of the really the front of the spine. The back of the spine is broken off. You know, it's worthless. It's wiggling. It's painful. And we're going to remove that lamina and spinous process with the decompression. But the uh, so what what are you going to fuse to? You got to fuse to the front. So you really get in deep. This is really deep stuff to get in there and get that fusion in there. If it doesn't fuse. You're going to end up with broken rods or broken screws and a tough, tough situation, a redo. So on these kids, you know, this age group, the adolescent uh, to young 20s, they have a very high fusion rate with this procedure. Uh, the pain that they had pre-op, within a few days they can tell that that's gone and they'd have a surgical pain, and that's always a really good sign. Um, let's see. Okay, so what about the grade threes and fours? Okay, I don't mess around watching those. Typically, they have a lot of pain anyway, and they have nerve root symptoms. This is a, a patient who is a 12-year-old, very serious basketball player from Appleton who uh, came in, and he had a grade three. A grade four slip is 100% the back of the of L5 would be in the front. It would be equal to the front of S1. And there's something called spondylopthesis, which is actually like a grade five. It's the L5 is all the way off and then it shifts down and it's sitting partially in front of S1, okay? So I don't want him gonna go on to a grade four or five. So, you know, he had a definite indication for fusion. And, and you know, I did this case several years back with my partner, and we did a fusion, you'll see in a minute, of the sacrum to L4, L3, because a grade three to four biomechanically, you need to fuse to a, a level vertebra. So you can see that L4 is still 
shifted forward a lot, and this one's more horizontal to the ground, so to speak. So you really need to, to bring it up there. This fella, at age 16, he was the highest scorer in uh, varsity basketball in the state of Wisconsin uh, for his last two years of high school, played for Appleton, and his dad sent me videos. So there is sports after fusion. I've had hockey players, uh, you know, uh, gymnasts uh, after healing. I don't recall a fusion on a gymnast that went to back, but they do get their life back. Unlike the adults that have spine fusions, kids do really well. I mean, some people are born with L5 fused to the sacrum. So in some cases, we're creating that in a young person with these fusions. So uh, it's a different creature. There's an excellent prognosis compared to the adult. Scoliosis, I'll try to pick up the pace a little. I'm not sure. I may be a little behind. Okay. Kids with scoliosis will uh, treat them with physical therapy if they have a mild curve. Curves greater than 30 degrees uh, recommend bracing and therapy. This is how you measure the curves. It's called the Cobb method, and uh, it's something you could look up in the textbooks, but you can see how you draw at the bottom of the lowest vertebra and the top of the highest, and this line would come way out here, so you draw the, the uh, potenus off of that, and you get the Cobb angle. But it's the same as what this line would be, if these two, if they intersected way out there. And, and we watch that. This is what a typical scoliosis brace looks like. They wear it 18 to 20 hours per day, until we're under control, then we may decrease it. There's a nighttime bending brace that has a horrible track record that I don't recommend. I just saw a girl recently who went on to need a spine fusion because she just had one of these nighttime bending braces. I never liked those. Surgical indications, uh, these are sort of the general numbers. Thoracic curves, 49 degrees or greater, lumbar 45 or greater, uh, or unremitting pain that you can't control with rest, uh, therapy. Uh, the reason those numbers are, are the cutoff is because after skeletal maturity, curve magnitudes less than that, they won't get worse. So then the only indication would be pain. But after skeletal maturity, if their curve is 46 uh, lumbar or 50 or greater thoracic, it will get worse typically about one degree per year. So if they have a 50 degree curve at age 14, you know, in 20 years, well, it'll be 70 degrees. And that was a study at University of Wisconsin by Sponseller. Okay, this is uh, what one looks like after we've put in the screws and rods to straighten it up. Uh, there's another case. This is a girl who's a dancer and uh, high, in high school, age 16. A lot of back pain, big trunk shift. And the before is on the right and the after is on the left. And those are titanium rods. They stay in, you know, they don't, they're not intended to be removed ever. So-called stay in forever. Those are big screws. Very powerful. Because the instrumentation is so strong now, we used to use hooks, multiple hooks, but now with the screws, it's so strong, there's really no activity restrictions. As soon as they feel great, they can do full activities. Usually it's about eight weeks post-op, they're back in their game. I've got cheerleaders, hockey players, basketball players. Dr. Edwards' first cousin had a, the same condition. He played varsity basketball. I saw him recently, he's doing great. He brought his, his kid to see me. You know, you know you're getting old when your patients are bringing their kids to see you? <laughs> Incredible. So yeah, there's return to sports after scoliosis surgery, absolutely. Uh, another oddball, briefly I'll run through it. This is a congenital scoliosis patient. There's multiple anomalies. Uh, she's a twin. Her brother has congenital kyphosis. So she had a fusion because of progression. And this is her brother. You see the kyphosis. Okay, uh, these are really active kids. They play multiple sports. The brother's an excellent shortstop. So uh, they return to sports as well. So, you know, in conclusion, uh, there's sports after spine problems in adolescence. They just need the appropriate diagnosis and treatment and excellent rehab. 
and uh, have to be you know, compliant. Thank you. Thank you.